Hi everyone. So in this video, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, we're going to discuss how different elements attain the octet rule. And uh, since we're discussing organic chemistry, let's again start with carbon because that's the backbone of organic compounds. So for carbon, what we already saw is that carbon has an electronic configuration of 1s2, 2s2, and 2p2. And it needs four additional electrons to complete the outer shell. Okay, so it needs four additional electrons to complete the outer shell. So how would it get these four electrons? So what carbon usually does is, it is going to share its valence electrons with other elements. So for example, in the simplest compound, like the simplest organic compound possible, okay, which is CH4, it has one carbon and four hydrogens. This compound is methane. What happens is carbon, it has four valence electrons. So we can draw a carbon with four of its valence electrons, okay? So these dots represent the valence electrons on carbon, and there are four hydrogens in this compound. Now each hydrogen, okay, hydrogen is 1s1. That's the electronic configuration of hydrogen. So each hydrogen has one electron to it. So that means, if the hydrogens organize around the carbon atoms or about the carbon atom such that the each hydrogen shares its one electron with one electron from the carbon what we'll notice is carbon is now going to have eight electrons overall around it okay so now if you count the number of electrons around carbon, and this includes the electrons from the hydrogen atoms, then carbon has a total of eight electrons around it. And so it has achieved an octet. So it is at eight electrons. So it got the four electrons now. But it's not just getting the electrons from the hydrogen. Now these four electrons are actually shared they're actually shared between carbon and hydrogen. That means the hydrogen also gets a share of those electrons. And so I can represent it like this. So the hydrogens now, each hydrogen now has two electrons on it. And this completes the octet for hydrogen also. Although you would now notice that the term octet doesn't really make sense because hydrogen only needs two electrons to complete its valence shell. It is 1s1. As long as it gets one more electron, it will become 1s2. And that's a complete shell because the next orbital is a 2s orbital. That's in a different principal quantum number. So hydrogen also uh, gets a complete shell of electrons. So this, uh, so both carbon and hydrogen, they achieve their octet by sharing electrons here, okay? They achieve the octet by sharing of electrons. Now, similarly, we can look at nitrogen, which is another element that's commonly found in organic compounds. So if you think about nitrogen, nitrogen is seven and 14. So the atomic number of nitrogen is seven. 
which means the electronic configuration is 1s2, 2s2, and 2p3. And now, as you would notice, in the valence shell, these are the valence electrons. So nitrogen has five valence electrons. What it needs is three additional electrons to complete uh, its valence shell, to get a complete shell of electrons. And so to do that, it is basically going to share electrons, uh, three electrons with other elements. Uh, so an example for this is a molecule such as NH3, ammonia, okay, ammonia. So in ammonia, what happens is the nitrogen, it has five electrons around it, two from 2s and three from uh, 2p. And so these five electrons can be represent around the nitrogen like this. So we have five dots to five to represent the five electrons. This is uh, the molecule is NH3, which is ammonia. Again, this molecule should be familiar. You've seen this in Gen Chem. So the three hydrogens, they each bring in one electron. And now if you look at it, the nitrogen has eight electrons around it. Okay, two, four, six, and eight. That's including the three uh, electrons from the three hydrogen atoms. And each hydrogen also gets a complete shell of two electrons. So the octet is completed for both nitrogen and hydrogen. So this octet rule kind of gets, uh, gives us a sense of how many bonds an atom is uh, usually going to make. And what we see here is, uh, sorry, so I, I said bonds because the sharing of electrons, this results in a bond between the elements, okay? So the two electrons here that are shared between the carbon and hydrogen atom, uh, I can draw this, I can draw this as carbon bonded to four hydrogen atoms, like that. So there are four bonds between the carbon and the four hydrogen atoms. So each line here, this is a bond, and it represents the two electrons, and those electrons are shared between them. So that's something important to keep in mind. Each line here is counted as two electrons, and that line represents a bond. So what we're seeing here is a common bonding pattern for carbon. What this tells us is carbon is going to make four bonds. That's going to be the most common bonding pattern for carbon, so that it has a complete octet. It has four electrons around it. And similarly, nitrogen here, you can probably guess the bonding pattern for nitrogen. Nitrogen here should make, uh, I'm going to draw this here. Nitrogen here has bonds to three hydrogen atoms three hydrogen atoms, and then it has a pair of electrons, which is called a lone pair. This pair of electrons is called a lone pair. A lone pair is a pair of electron that is not involved in bonding, okay? So it's not a bonded pair of electrons because realize that this line here represents a bond, it has two electrons in it, but those two electrons are shared between the nitrogen and the hydrogen atom. 
these two electrons are also shared between nitrogen and atom. Okay, so that's one way that elect uh, that atoms can complete their octets. And for both of these compounds, what we're looking at is sharing of electrons. Now, this is not the only way that atoms complete their octets, okay? So I'll give you a very different example. Uh, but before we go there, whenever atoms complete their octets by sharing of electrons, the bond that's formed, okay, this bond is called a covalent bond covalent bond and it is formed by sharing of electrons that's how the covalent bond is formed so it's a covalent bond so that means this carbon here forms four covalent bonds with the four hydrogen atoms the nitrogen atom here forms three covalent bonds with the three hydrogen atoms because they are sharing electrons so that each atom in the compound has a complete octet okay now let's go to the other way or the other mode by which atoms can achieve an octet so let's think about a molecule like sodium fluoride or a compound like sodium fluoride, NaF. Now, uh, sodium is, and to keep it simple, I'm only going to put down the atomic number. So sodium has an atomic number of 11. Fluorine has an atomic number of nine. So, if you think about it, now for sodium, the electronic configuration, its electronic configuration should work out to 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, and 3s1. That's 11 electrons, 2, 4, 10, plus 1, 11. For fluorine, on the other hand, its electronic configuration is going to be 1s2, 2s2, 2p5 okay so if you look at fluorine here this has five plus two seven electrons in its valence shell which is the outermost shell so seven electrons in the outermost shell it needs only one electron so plus one electron is going to give it an octet. This will give it an octet. Sodium, on the other hand, it's 3s1, and we still have 3p here. In fact, there's 3d orbitals also, okay? But if we keep it simple, and if we just talk about 3s and 3p, it would seem like it needs an additional seven electrons, because 3s needs one more electron. The 3p would need six more electrons to complete an octet if sodium were to gain electrons. So the question here is, is there another way that sodium can get its octet, which means it can get a complete shell of electrons, a filled shell of electrons. And uh, uh, one of the probable ways this can happen is if sodium instead of adding electrons, if it loses one electron, okay? If it loses one electron, because if you look at it, it has a 3s1. And if it loses this one electron, it is going to bring it to an octet. Let's bring it to an octet. So the way we can represent this is, so we have sodium and in its valence shell, which is now this third one, right? So uh, I hope this is clear. So when sodium loses its one electron, 
its valence shell is now going to become the 2s and the 2p, which would have eight electrons. We're not trying to get eight electrons into the third uh, principal quantum number, pr uh, principal level, okay? That's not what we're doing here. We're trying to basically keep uh, uh, the filled shell as the 2p. So if we have sodium, and we can source, we can show one valence electron on the sodium because it is 3s1, that's how much it has. Fluorine has seven valence electrons, so that's going to be one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. So if sodium transfers its electron to fluorine, okay, just gives it. So this gives the one electron to fluorine. Uh, the reason I'm raising these arrows is because those arrows have some meaning to them. And so I don't want to make it too complicated at this point. Uh, but what I would like you to know is in organic chemistry, when we are transferring one electron, now, this is not an organic compound, but when you transfer one electron, you show a single-headed arrow. That's, what's, uh, that's why I'm like uh, basically doing this. But let's just say that sodium gives its one electron to the fluorine atom. What this would give us is now sodium, which is missing one of its electrons. And so this sodium would now get a positive charge on it, okay? And the fluorine is now going to have eight electrons around it. It had seven initially, but now one electron has been added from the sodium to the fluorine. And so it's going to have eight electrons around it. And that would give the, so, the fluorine a negative charge. And so what we made here is uh, an ionic compound. We have a compound which has ions. Uh, there is a positive charged ion, which is called a carbocation. We have a negative charged ion, which is called a car, uh, uh, sorry. My bad. Uh, this is not a carbocation because it's not carbon-based. So we have a positively charged ion, which is a cation. Uh, we have a negatively charged ion, which is an anion. And these are going to attract each other. And that attraction, the force of attraction, is called an ionic bond. And so ionic bonds are formed by transfer of electrons. So ionic bond is formed by a transfer of electrons. Uh, so that's the other mode in which elements can or atoms can form compounds, okay, by transferring electrons resulting in the formation of ionic bonds. Uh, now why does the sodium have a positive charge? Uh, because realize that this atomic number tells us the number of electrons and protons inside the nucleus. Protons are positively charged, electrons are negatively charged. Since this number is the number of electrons as well as the number of protons, that means a sodium atom has 11 protons in the nucleus, it has 11 electrons in the nucleus, they both match up. So you have 11 positive charges, you have 11 negative charges, they cancel each other out. But when the sodium transfers, okay, transfers an electron to the fluorine, it is losing one of its electrons. So now there are more positive charges. There's one more positive charge in the nucleus because the number of protons is still the same, but the number of electrons have dropped by one so that it can get to 10. And that's why the sodium has one positive charge. And the same thing applies to the fluorine. Atomic number nine means there are nine protons, nine electrons, protons positively charged, electrons negatively charged, cancel each other out. But when the one electron is transferred from sodium to fluorine, now fluorine has 10 electrons, nine protons, 
that means one extra negative charge that's why we put that negative charge on it okay so that's uh, the way like the octet rule is satisfied for elements sometimes they share sometimes they transfer electrons depending on whichever is best